All right, welcome everyone. So if you are here, it's because you want to learn all about vegetables as menu stars, strategies to raise status and deliver flavor. And to introduce this session and its moderator, I am very happy to bring to the podium Todd Gosul, who's the VP of Sales and Marketing for B&W Quality Growers, the sponsor of this session and a great partner in front of the CIA. Todd? Hi, thank you, everybody. Um, uh, B&W, we've, we've had the pleasure and honor of working with the CIA for the last uh, six years now. And so it's been, it's been, a, been a great ride and, and a great partnership. And um, had the opportunity, obviously, to, uh, to uh, work with Ming. And, and I think everybody uh, you know, enjoyed yesterday, and they're going to enjoy today as well. So um, what I want to do is I want to um, I want to introduce uh, Kathy nash -Holly. Um Kathy is the publisher and editor of uh, Flavor, uh, Flavor in the Menu uh, since, since, since its inception 20 years ago. Um, Kathy has also done presentations on flavor trends, industry events, and also past president of the International Food Service uh, Editorial Council. Um, if you're not familiar with, with uh, uh, Kathy's publication, it is available on the second floor, so please feel free to take a look at it. Um, but without further ado, I want to introduce uh, Kathy nash Holly. Thank you, Todd. And I'm glad to be here presenting to you on a subject that, that I love to talk about. And uh, we talk about this a lot in, um, in our publication. Um, Veg-centricity, and, and what is veg-centricity? And what I want to say about this is, if you all recall that working with ve kind of vegetable shifting to the center of the plate and getting center plate treatment um, happened around the same time as the nose to tail movement came about. So a handful of years ago, uh, chefs started using, you know, nose to tail, all parts of the, of the animal, and, and kind of as a, as a partner component to that, started exploring um, all parts of the vegetable in some way, and, and just started, you know, elevating the vegetable to center plate status. Now that does not mean it was replacing the protein components, so a lot of veg-centric forward chefs are really still leaning on the flavor components of, of proteins that they uniquely offer. Um, but and they're, they're really looking at, at vegetables in a way, they're really treating vegetables in a way that they might treat animal proteins. So the, uh, the kind of high, high heat uh, techniques and brining and pickling and, and all, all manner of different layering of flavor. So we have a couple chefs here to kind of demonstrate veg centricity um, as they see it and talk through the trend uh, um, as it's taking place in their kitchens and translate that to a broader scene across American food, food service. Uh, first up, we have Ming Tsai, and you know Ming Tsai. You've got an introduction for, to him yesterday. You certainly probably knew him coming in, so he needs, he needs very little introduction. Blue Ginger, about 20 years. It just, uh, just closed last year so that he can kind of move on to another chapter here. But also um, uh, his uh, Chowsters concept and, and PBS's uh, Simply Ming. He's the author of five cookbooks. And I um, was kind of terrified when I, after watching his session yesterday and realizing I'm moderating his session. So I'm going to give him all the time he, we can have here and bring out Ming Tsai. Thank you, Kathy. All right, you guys hear me? 22 minutes? What do I have? 30 minutes? We do like a 12 course tasting. Um, so, I'm Chinese. No shocker there. But in Chinese cuisine, vegetables is always center, right? We, the Asian, not just Chinese, by the way, the Asian diet always has vegetables as part of the meal. And we use meat in general for flavoring. So a bone-in ribeye in this country, that's one person. That could feed eight people in a Chinese dish just as well, right? Because you can take the fat and use that to stir fry, et cetera, et cetera. It's no secret, I think, that in general, the Asians are healthier than this country and a lot of Western countries. A lot of it is, of course, diet. I mean, you are what you eat, period. All right, 
So this is about as serious as I'm going to get. All right, now, these two rabbis walk... No, never mind. Um, I'm doing two dishes, and I hopefully you had this and had the opportunity to eat it. Um, we're doing a shrimp shumai, but instead of using just traditional... For me, it's, it's not traditional. For me, it's shrimp pureed with eggs. I use frozen butter. That's my French training. And usually I would do the dish, and that would be the shrimp shumai. I'm going to add 50% of what's called Power 4. This is a great product that we're doing that b and does. It's, uh, it's really the healthiest green mix out there, period, on the market, right? Of course, watercress, baby red kale, arugula, and baby spinach. It is awesome. So what I'm going to do is, hello, hi. You don't have to have a ming size Simply Ming pan to cook well, but if you want my kids to go to college, you do. <laughs> Think about that. Wait till the water's bubbling at a minimum. It doesn't actually matter with these pans because this has to be ceramic, but if you have a normal, good stainless steel pan that, of course, is either copper or aluminum, if you add salt to water that's not boiling yet, that salt could actually pit the bottom of your pan. So you make sure there's at least some boiling. And when you add salt, Again, this is ceramic, so I'm not worried about it, but you want to really not put salt in cold water and then bring it to a boil, okay? And my crew thinks I'm crazy, but boiling water is only 212. It's not that hot. I'm sticking my not finger usually. Here's fingers are going to boil, but I taste all the water in the restaurant because there's a good salted water and there's not good salted water, right? And the reason you need to have salted water is I want to keep this greenness of these greens, right? So the chlorophyll really builds up when you can do that. So here I'm just going to take a good handful of this. All right. And we're just going to blanch it for about 30 seconds, maybe. And you can see how it gets greener, right? So naturally green. The chlorophyll comes out. All right. So 30 seconds, I'm going to shock it in a nice water bath. We're going to start to shoo my the um, shrimp mix. So, and I'm very Chinese, this is a waste, but we do everything right here at the CIA. So, what I mean is, I would use baby shrimp because I'm gonna puree this. So, don't get the big expensive shrimp, use the small ones. But we're the CIA, so it doesn't matter. Shrimp, I'll do it all. Then we're gonna take egg. I opened up a dozen eggs in Montana three days ago Seven twins. That's not natural. Seven double yolks in 12 eggs. Think about that. Something's going on there. I didn't realize they used in vitro um, for, for hens. Puree this shrimp super smooth. Salt and pepper. This is the Ming Lean. You don't need to open it up and put a spatula to it. Let the centrifugal force of the blade grab it from the sides. All right. It, it could be a Thomas Keller lean, too. It doesn't have to be a mean lean. Shock this. Shock it to stop the cooking, right? So this is high nutrition, guys. There's a lot of good stuff in here. Then think about that person, that really pissed you off, right? Squeeze the shit out of that person, all right? Get all of that water out. Because he should have told you, right? Bullshit, he didn't tell you. So that quarter bag ends up being that, right? High veg. So, you want it nice and smooth. Then I'm going to add frozen butter. You may say, like, holy, that's a lot of butter. Yep, you're right. It's a lot of butter. Butter makes it better. And this is from my pastry training in France. We're then going to pulse it until the butter is really small pieces. I do not want, the reason it's frozen is you don't want it to smear. I don't want the butter to incorporate, because then the mousse will be tough. 
So like pat brise and pat sucre, when you add little pieces of butter left, when it cooks, the butter melts away, it flavors it, but it leaves air pockets, right, because it steams. That's how you get a flaky crust. That's also how you get a tender mousse. So every now and then, I'd rather have a big piece of butter in my shumai and let it melt away than have it all small and some smeared. Smeared's no good, all right? All right, a couple more. All right, perfect. So now, I'm going to take this, wipe the board clean here. I'm just going to mince this, super fine. All right. Again, great flavor, guys. I, I'm sure all of you know that watercress and kale are the only two vegetables in the world that are basically perfect. They each bat 1,000 on the NDI, Nutritional Density Index. Kale's over. I like kale, but kale, we're kaled out, right? We, I mean, who loves kale? Who eats kale for breakfast? Lunch, dinner, kale shakes, kale juices. It's awesome. Watercress, better. Better flavor, in my opinion. But we combine it. So this mix has two perfect vegetables. Everyone knows spinach, talk to Popeye. Right? And then arugula is just a delicious, bitter vegetable, which intuitively means it's good for you, right? It's nature. If it's bitter, it's good for you. Period. All right. So here we have super dry. And we're basically going to take then 50 50 of this mousse. Okay? And you may be saying, do you have to have? The butter, yes, you do. It makes it that much better. I mean, and I'll ask you, of course not, you don't. So a shumai traditionally in China, you would take a cleaver and smash the shrimp and just kind of spread it, and you would add ginger and scallions, maybe. They would never add butter in China, and you can still make a shumai and go. All right, I'm going to add two things. Sorry, my board's so messy here. I'm going to add some just chopped chives. Because you need an alien group, I think, in almost anything savory. And then ginger. Everyone know how to peel ginger? Is my time up yet? No, it's been, it's been six minutes. Ginger. Back of a knife. Super easy to peel, right? Super easy to peel. If you have children, this is a little dangerous, right? Knife towards body. Spoon. No kid, no adult, no one can cut themselves with a spoon. You have to be really strong. Spoon is awesome to peel ginger. If you use a peeler, you don't get, because you got to get deep because of these, like that nub right there, peeler can't get through that. And the reason you peel it is because the skin is really tough. It's not bad for you. So if I was doing a red roast or a braise or something, I would just wash it. Always wash, right? And that's one thing I should just say. Always wash everything, except actually... Honestly, B and W greens because it's washed like how many times, Todd? Triple wash. Triple wash. Those you don't have to. So you can just focus on this. So this is how you mince ginger, guys. Very fibrous, right? Lots of striations this way. So what I like to do, you take off the ends that are a little bit tough, and you make really you see that as thin as you can go. Right? Then with that you stack it. Okay. Then with that, you make julienne, as they say in France, right? Because you try to take this to a food processor, you're going to get just stringy, stringy, stringy ginger. And what I want is a little pop, a little piece of ginger when you eat this. Then you turn it, then you come back across, and, you know, we call this brunoise, but you keep going, and then it becomes minced, okay? Oops. Ginger is a great natural antioxidant. If you're ever pregnant and nauseous, take ginger syrup, make yourself tea. All right, that's the shumai mix, guys. So at the restaurant, we would take a little bit. The only time we ever use a microwave in the restaurant is to reheat coffee and to test. Test mousses, test fillings, test stuff. Or you put it in a fryer, or you can put a little boiling water. Anything, because you gotta test for seasoning. I'm gonna assume this is spot on, because I can. 
You know what? This is so messy. We're going to go to this next work. All right. Wonton skins, wrappers. Awesome. To make a shumai, it's really not that hard. You actually put it off center. You make a C with your hand. And then you kind of grab a little bit of the mousse and you go around. Right? So then you have this shumai. And then you have to drop it on a board to make the bottom flat. And you bring up the side so it's a little bit thinner here. It could be a little thicker up top. All right? I'll show you again. We just made 300 of these. They're pretty easy. Right? And in China, and some Chinese restaurants, there's these you know, 70, 80 year old Chinese women, they go one hand, right? Because you can. I'm actually not a 70 year old Chinese woman. But with today's technology, right? You never know when in California stays young. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Please don't write that down. So just by looking at the luscious butteriness there and all those greens and the shrimp, butter is not the healthiest thing in the world. You know what, guys? Walk an extra mile. Big deal. Seriously. You got to live. So the story goes, and this is a true story, and I'm pretty smart. I'll just throw that out there. I did study mechanical engineering in college. PB equals NRT. I actually graduated from college. So I'm cooking at the Aspen Food and Wine Fest, I don't know, 12, 14 years ago. Um, sometimes you go and you do stuff. Sometimes you get hired to do private catering. So I was hired for, with Taiku to do a private thing, 10 little dim sum for 120 people at Prince Wally Wally's house, real name. Gigantic mansion. The guest pool house was 3,500 square feet. That's where we cook. So bus shows up, so it's show up at 7 o'clock. Shumai, steamed, take eight minutes, perfect. Big Chinese steamer, big thing. Boom, 10 minutes out, steam it. Bus shows up, all right, guys, fire the saute, fire the shumai, fire the, you right? Eight minutes later, open the shumai. Water does not boil at the same temperature at altitude. Every four-letter word, golf, food, love, came out of my mouth. I'm supposed to be the man. I had a hundred raw dough, shrimp, and egg inedible globs of horribleness. Like, holy, right? On the wall was a huge paella pan that was used. I could tell it was seasoned. I'm like, grab that. This big. We put it on the grill. We take the shumai, and, and this was on the cup. We took the shumai, and we said, Boom, because they were raw. We smashed them, right, with wet hands. And then we said, okay, get that pie thing down. We then took a pan, and then we added oil to the pan, and we seared them instead. We took the whole pan and put it around bricks with sternal below it. It was the best dish of the night. Smash shumai. And it's on my menu now, and it'll never go away. Just like how, you know, Reese's peanut butter cups were created. I think that was how they were created. You guys, all, you're old enough to know that commercial, right? No? How about the Sesame Street 10 chocolate souffles a la mode, and they fall down? I thought that was really cool. Okay, I may be alone. So oil, when, you, when oil hits a pan, it's got to move and dance a little bit. And when it does that, it means it was hot. And when it does that, when you add something, it, does, it doesn't stick that. If you try to put this in a cold pan and then you add oil, even though if you get it to that same temperature, it'll then stick. That's the secret of scallops and fish and all that. Get your pan, and by the way, you can't have your pan on super heat so it starts to smoke and then add oil, that doesn't work. Medium heat so it's warm, so when the oil hits, it dances, then the shumai doesn't move. I mean, then the shumai doesn't stick, all right? So these will take about, I don't know, three minutes probably. You want to get a GB and d golden brown delicious, and we serve it. All right, I'm going to go back here while we're doing this. This is a three vinegar syrup that we're going to put on top of the shumai. It's Chinese black vinegar, Japanese rice, and Italian balsamic. This is like the UN. And we reduce it 
And we lift, once it's reduced to a syrup, because there's tons of sugar, obviously, and, and vinegars, usually from grapes, you reduce it, then lift it in a, in a Vitamix or any good blender with a little bit of grapeseed oil, and you get this great kind of maple syrupy, delicious vinegariness. I think that's a word, right? Vinegariness. So again, I want to get it, yeah, so that's pretty good. That's pretty G, B, and D there, right? I can go a little longer. Yell out a question? Any questions? They all out. I know there's a Q&A at the end, but if there's any cooking questions. No one? Okay. Who does shumai at home? That's a shocker. Huh? Who's going to do shumai? That's a good question. Yeah, everyone tonight. Meet their French laundry, shumai. Say that again. Oh, if I, was, if I didn't smash them, traditionally you steam them. Bamboo steamer, stainless steel steamer, you steam them. And I would, I would not smash them. I keep them nice and high. And they're delicious. So these you could steam too, um, easily. I like it because there's textural difference. I love, I mean, seriously, guys, a chocolate sundae, hot, cold, crunchy nuts, creaminess, perfect bite. You should always try to get crunchy and smooth, hot and cold. Spicy sweet. There's no spice in a chocolate sundae. It's only what you could do. There's, I had a chocolate today that had fish sauce. It wasn't bad. It really wasn't bad because, you know, of course, Florida cell and chocolates make sense. Why not fish sauce? Right? So these are looking pretty good. Oh, yeah. Look at that. That's what we're talking about. You guys can see that. Houston, you can see this. Yeah, actually, we'll do this. You can see this better. I'm going to leave it there. Ooh, these look good. And I, you know what? I like these better than the, the original originals because of the added greens. I just think it makes, just makes it more well-rounded, and you're using half the amount of mousse, so hence, it's better for you. But... I, I'm not a diet chef. I'm not. I just cook the way I like to eat. And yes, there's butter, but guess what? Don't eat 12 of them. And eat your greens. Right? So there's vinegar syrup. Say again? The three vinegars. Chinese, Chinese black, Xinjiang, um, balsamic, and Japanese rice. All right, guys? Smash them through my first dish. Okay, now we, now we get a break. No? No break? Jesus. Yes, we get a break. Look, I have the beer. So, hand here, tight, right? Important. Get it underneath the cap, then you can pop it, all right? That's how you drink a beer. Okay, now for my third course. I'm using the beer for a batter, by the way. All-purpose flour, cornstarch. Oops. Cornstarch. Baking soda. Baking powder. Okay. Beer. So this is a beer batter. Uh, it helps with the beer's cold. Yeah, it keeps the gluten down. Um, it's important that the beer is good, right? Like cooking wine, this doesn't exist in this country anymore, right? If it says cooking wine, do not drink it. Do not use it to cook because it's not good enough to drink. It says, it says cooking wine. No. This, I mean, look, you can now from Chile and Argentina and all this, stuff, there's wines that are five bucks that are really good. I mean, two buck chuck, fantastic to cook with. Right? Two dollars. You kidding me? So, add the beer. You're looking for pancake batter consistency. Right? A, a touch looser than pancake batter. A touch looser. All right? This is a really easy. All right? Then, watercress. So, test your fryer. That's good. You want a little bit of movement there. It got brown really quick, so I'm going to turn it down just a notch. 
but we're just going to individually take watercress, nice big ones here, and this is just a way to have a 100% vegetarian, vegan tempura. Obviously, tempura quite often is chicken, quite often it's mushrooms, could be anything. But look how quick it just crisps up. And this batter is so good, it stays crisp for the longest time. And then we'll drain it. Hello, lemon. And you'll see, it's amazing how it, it holds its shape. And it'll hold its shape for, I don't know, four or five minutes because of this crispiness of this batter. I'm going to do a little bit more. That was a, obviously super hot oil, so it cooks instantly. So I'm going to get a couple of other big ones here. You can also use the uh, Bean W's is great, like you see in a steakhouse, the large bunches of watercress. Uh, that would be equally awesome in this thing, right? Take this. Take that. And this says, look, I'm not going to go out and say this is diet food either because this is fried, right? But it is completely veg-centric. It is only veg, right? And is it being used as a condiment for fried batter? Yes, it is. But that's okay. This is a fantastic batter for anything. Any veg you can think of. Shiitakes, I love in particular. But obviously zucchini, onions, scallions, the whole nine yards. All right, I'm going to do one more. So this is a way to start a meal as a snack. And flip it once. All right. Say again. Um, it would get eggy. Yeah. It would get vo it would get even more voluminous. You see how the shumai puffed up by twice? That's the egg. So it would actually just get more voluminous. Can I get a, um, I'm talking to no one. Can I get a plate? Sure, I'll get a plate for you, chef. Hey, you've been working out a lot? No, not really. I've just been doing yoga. Oh, it's all right. Great. You sure I've been doing Pilates? No, just mostly yoga. Okay, thank you. Bikram? Yes, Bikram. Okay, got a plate. Nice people back there. So, <laughs> yeah, we're going to do one thing. Balance of flavor, I'm very big on. So we have this great crispy fried, but I want to bring some acid into this, right? So we're going to do just a little bit of zest, just a touch. And then a little bit of fresh juice. And we're literally just going to put it on top uh, some more fresh watercress with lemon, right? Just take some fresh, really simple, guys. This is not haute cuisine. I'm going to do lemon juice. Don't need oil, right? Because it's fried. Lemon zest. This needs a little bit of salt. When we salt a blue dragon, or whatever French fries, we salt from, I tell my guys that you have to be at least two feet away, and you have to do that. Because interns, rookies salt like this. Well, that bite's going to be horrible, right? So always from here. So our floor at blue dragon, 60% of the salt shouldn't hit your French fry bowl. Because otherwise, you're going to get way too much. So sprinkle, always high. All right, take your tempura. All right, and here we have um, the perfect puree of Napa Valley. No, this is a sambal aioli. So make a classic aioli, egg yolks. Uh, we use a little garlic, oil, grapeseed, and sambal, which is a really good spicy uh, chili condiment. La jiao in Chinese. 
Easy, simple. And we did this today, and I just I encourage you to use your hands because you want to grab the citrusy, lemony, fresh watercress below and grab the crispy, rich watercress fried on top. That's what we got, guys. How much time do I have? Should I do another course? How, how much was that? Is that 20 minutes? About 19? Eight minutes and 39 seconds. So we've got the reverse of yesterday. Um, a couple questions, though. We have d plenty of time for questions from the audience, and I've got a couple. So anyone? Yes. Just, just to repeat, what's the reasoning on the grapeseed grape oil? Yeah. So um, I used to be a big canola oil guy, right? And I still use them in my fryers because filling three fryers with grapeseed oil would be really expensive. There's only there's certain types of oil that have really high smoking temperature, right? Grapeseed, canola, for example, peanut. So you can fry with it, you can walk through with it, and it won't smoke. If you tried to use extra virgin olive oil to even just do this, it would smoke and get bitter. So... <laughs> Grape seed, if it's a CIA budget, I use. <laughs> At Blue Dragon, if you're eating the oil, I will use grape seed. In other words, if it's in a stir fry, chicken fat grape seed combo is fantastic. And if I'm frying, I guess you're e eating the oil, but canola oil is what we use. And actually, downstairs, they're using canola oil in the fryers. But grape seed has a great smoking temperature uh, and has a nutty flavor, which I really like too. And it's it's more expensive. It's like Floricel versus kosher salt. It's that more expensive. It's worth it, right? And by the way, spend money on salt, guys. You're never going to go through that for five months. I know it costs 20 bucks and it's pink alea or black sea of all. You're not going to use it that much. Spend the money on salt. Uh, and don't use the one with the umbrella because it tastes like iodine. Iodine. It's iodine salt. Don't use that. It's horrible salt. Great for driveways. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, and then that, I tell you, the other thing about um, if I'm just on the subject of salt, soy sauce is an awesome way of adding, it doesn't work if it's obviously sprinkling, but it's a great way of adding saltiness with less sodium. Because you can use about 20% less soy sauce in comparison to NaCl, sodium content. So less sodium content, but it'll taste even better. So for braises and sauces and vinaigrettes, soy sauce will give that extra umami quality, that fifth taste sensation that all of us chefs try to, try to achieve, right? We want that savoriness. Has everyone heard of kokumi? the sixth taste sensation, right? So I was at Zuma in New York when they first opened, talking to the chef, and he goes, ah, oh, mix up, kokumi. I'm like, kokumi? And kokumi is the sixth taste sensation that is umami with fat. So braised oxtail and really fatty like A5 Kobe beef, if it's done cooked right, it has kokumi. And that coats your palate even more than umami. Just kind of cool. I'm sure there's a seven one out there. Don't, no idea what it is yet. Anyway, a good question. Questions? Anyone else? You know, a couple thoughts come to mind watching you do this. Um, will you put on your global mashup hat and trans translate these to other global, like could you do this, the shumai application in an okonomiyaki, for example? You know what? Okonomiyaki, like a Japanese pancake or Okonomiyaki? Something. Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's chopped shrimp in okonomiyaki, and it's similar because sure. they actually do put flour and they put egg in it. Right. Uh, look, this is a classic filling that would work with an empanada. I mean, it's, it's everything's even done for. If anyone ever says they're inventing a cuisine, just leave. No one's invented a cuisine. <laughs> not even Keller. Not even uh, uh, Ferran Adria. They were inspired and influenced, and they're, they're, they're geniuses, but they didn't invent a cuisine, right? Uh, it just it doesn't happen that way. So wrapping something and steaming or cooking or frying or searing is in every single culture. Mm -hmm. and, and what was so interesting, when I, in early in my career, I ended up at Santa Fe, at Santa Cafe, where I did East Meets Southwest cuisine, which on the onset sounded really weird. But then once I realized chilies, cilantro, lime juice, that's, that sounds like Thai food, right? I mean, but that's Mexican food and Latino food. And so that's... Cilantro is the number one consumed herb in the world. Just crushes everyone else. And, and there's a reason. So all of Latin America is cilantro. All of Asia is cilantro, right? Now America, we use cilantro. So it's everywhere. So, you know, no one, I always said, I said this to Kel, and I've said this to Grant Atkins, I've said this to even Danielle and John George, they're all doing East-West cuisine. They just call it New French. 
new American, new something. It's all east-west, right? Everyone's using white soy sauce and ginger and lemongrass and sesame oil and whatever from, because that's what we do. We try to find the best possible flavors using the best technique in front of us that we know based on training. And the closer the product comes to your restaurant, in generally the better, yeah. right? But if you live in North Dakota, there's not a lot of salmon coming in, so you're going to bring it in from Norway or from you know wherever, Faroe Islands. But that's okay, right? I mean, the fish in Vegas is actually the same fish, and quite often you get in Boston. You're like, what? No, not the day boat scallops coming off from the boat, no. But if you're bringing in beautiful tuna, that tuna caught in Martha's Vineyard, shipped to Tsukiji in Japan, shipped back to the port in Boston, and then FedEx to Vegas. It's crazy how that happens, but that's what mm -hmm. happens to a big tuna. Mm -hmm. It goes all the way over there and comes all the way back. Mm -hmm. That's one of our major problems with this country, I think, the tuna travel. <laughs> and, uh, oh, what's that lawyer's name? Oh, shoot. <laughs> Never mind. We have more problems than just tuna in this country, I think. I can see. No, we don't. Do we, Do we have any problems in this country? Seriously? No, none. Um, I will say for the record, if I may. Yeah. Since since I'm making this, no, I'm not. Food is so important. Food is the glue of not only the United States of America, food is the glue of the world. And I've always said, if we just took a little bit more time and slowed down and sat at the table with your kids, oh my God, novel, and actually cooked, this place would be so much better. Mm -hmm. Right, I mean, I, I'm so honored. I got to cook for the president of China and at the time, Vice President Biden and Ma Madam Secretary Clinton. And it was at the State Department, and it's Chinese president, so I'm not doing miso sake butterfish, right? But I am doing, you know, soy sauce ginger butterfish. And I, you know, and I know, because culture matters, Chinese don't eat raw vegetables, ever. Chinese love soup. So we did a sweet potato soup with an Asian duck confit. Long, long and short of it, it was actually quite funny, because I got to meet him. and. Uh, Hu Jintao, surprisingly engaging, speaks fluent English, and when I met him, his daughter was at Harvard. So he had skin in the game in our country. So I meet him with Clinton and Biden, and you know, uh, security, a translator, and tons of press. Uh, but I speak Chinese. So I immediately said, hi, honored to meet you. He immediately said, were you born here or, or in China? I'm like, I was born in Newport Beach. Where are your, it's all in Chinese. Where are your parents from? You know, Beijing, Lida. So both from Beijing. What kind of food do you do? This is a president of China. He asked me. I mean, he's a busy man. But for about four minutes, we're talking. Two and a half minutes into this, you know, Clinton and Biden's like, well, what's going on? I'm, like, I'm talking about nuclear disarmament. Don't worry about it. I got it. <laughs> and we kept going. And, and they're like, is he really? <laughs> like, no, he's talking about tuna. I'm like, okay. Yes. Because I could talk about nuclear disarmament, but I'm not sure I'd be that good. Although I would be better than, yeah, easy. <laughs> Like tenfold, <laughs> seriously? No, no, sorry, a hundredfold. Um, after that meal, Clinton actually, she loved the meal and all thing. The next day, contacts me and says, you know what? Hu Jintao was so pleased about the food that you thought about doing it Chinese, but it wasn't Chinese Chinese, it was Chinese flavor profile that he understood and he loved it that the negotiations went five times better than they thought it would. Because who can negotiate well hangry? Mm -hmm. Right? No, no one. And from that, the state core, the, sh the chef core found, uh, group was formed. So they asked like 10 of us to be ambassadors. So whenever I traveled the country, and I did the first one in the Azores, we would call the State Department, and if we could cook with the ambassador or whoever of that country, it's a great way of bringing people together. Fantastic. So I really think. And as a side note, and don't print this officially, please, but if you had to go home every day to dry chickpeas that was unseasoned and room temperature, I'd be pulling my vest too, right? Seriously. But you're not going to pull your vest if you're going home to Peking Duck. No way. You're going to go home and eat Peking Duck and have a gla freaking glass of Jevy Chambertin, and you're going to live better. I think we got to do that. I think we have to sit down at the table and cook more. It can be through the blue apron, or it doesn't matter. Just sit down and cook more. It's mm -hmm. so important. I can't, I can't stress that enough. But can I talk to you a little bit about watercress since I'm here? Because I know a lot about it. For about 20 seconds, you can. Well, oh, the timing thing again? Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, the Chinese are the number one consumer of watercress. I've been cooking watercress and eating watercress since I was born. Number two, who knows? Country in the world eats the most watercress. England, 
because of the cheese sandwiches. And England's this big, so think about that. The thing I love, the bunch watercress that these guys go down in BW has a zero water consumption. It's amazing. They start down in Vero Beach, they grow these amazing farmers that are literally whistling, right, because they take such good care of them, which I think is so important. They have air-conditioned thing, the whole nine yards. They follow the watercress all the way up north. They're using the water from the ground. By the time they come back, the water table is back. Zero water consumption. Mm. It's the only vegetable in the world that can claim that because mm. watercress has to grow in flowing water. So think about that as well because we do have a world, one world, mm -hmm. um, and ditto for the seas. Think about your – you can't – don't eat stuff that's close to being in danger, right? You just right. don't, please. Right. Ming, wow. on that note, fantastic. That's thank it? you so much. All right, guys, thank you. Wait, no, I'm going to do one more, sorry, because I did get flack yesterday. On my heart, and we're just going to clean up. This is so important. This is something I think every chef does, and some of us do it more, and other ones don't, is we give back. How do we give back? We do it with food. My, on my heart is Family Reach. Please go to familyreach.org if you can. We're the only national chair that financially helps families who have a child with cancer. The number one cause of personal bankruptcy in this country today is cancer. Think about that. That's not Obamacare. Thank God there's Obamacare. It's just that meds and this and that, that's covered. Even St. Jude's covers that. But guess what? The mom stopped working. Shh, your income's had. I've met these families, and now they're my friends because I've saved them. I've met, this is 20 seconds, Chinese style. Go. There's, she was a single mom. Michaela was one, cancer the second time. She was then broke. They lived two years in a homeless shelter, yeah. getting chemo and radiation. That's not even humane. Mm -mm. That, that, that's ridiculous. More ridiculous is the doctor told Raquel, your, bone, your son needs a bone marrow transplant to live. But unfortunately, because of your sanitary conditions in the homeless shelter, we cannot administer it. It won't stick. Sorry. You cannot tell mom, sorry, your son's going to die. Family steps in, that's bullshit. Here's your apartment back for a year. You take care of your son, we got your lodging. This kid is now nine years old, celebrating his seventh year remission, and every time I see him, he gives me the biggest hug. Nice. That's the most important thing that all of the chefs can do. All right, thank you guys. Thank you, man. And for the record, B&W's been a huge supporter of Family Reach, which is how this partnership formed. So hats off to B&W right. for everything you right, guys have done. thank you. Thank you, guys. All right, next up, a quick transition. Next up, we have Chef Rick Lopez. And Rick got his start, uh, his culinary start, in, uh, in Maine, where, where I live, which is a nice connection, seeing how we just met each other yesterday in the kitchen over his carrot salad. Um, but he is a native Texan, and he uh, brought his culinary journey back to San Antonio, uh, worked in the fine dining restaurant Las Canarias, Canarias and then began a stage series in New York, including with Gavin Kaysen, Cafe Balloon, uh, Terrence Brennan and Pichelin, and Ed Brown at 81, returned to Texas in 2009, and has been at La Condesa, where he is now executive chef. So let's bring on Rick Lopez. Is this thing on? Can you guys hear me? Can we turn the bass up a little bit? Just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, so we got a lot going on, and we're talking about vegetables today, which is funny because I didn't eat a single vegetable today. It was Doritos, and I think we had brisket for lunch. But we're going to make it fun. Um, I should say that being here has been pretty inspiring uh, just to hear people talk and other chefs talk and people taste your food, and so many ideas are being exchanged in that little hallway over there that when you see dishes that you've done before and things that you're used to doing in your own house, it's almost just like, I don't even know if I'm doing it right anymore. So it's, it's inspiring, it's cool, and it's really cool to talk to you guys about you know, what we do in our everyday life at La Condesa, what we do for vegetables, and what we really do for the culture and the cuisine of what is Mexico. So we do modern Mexican food, um, and it's one of those things that it's, um, you know, we used fusion back in the 90s, and I remember the 90s, and then everything kind of became very modern, and it started taking an uptick towards what are chefs learning in other parts of the, the nation, you know, from coast to coast, and where are they bringing it back to their culture? For me, uh, bringing it back to my Hispanic roots, I, I was learning French for the longest time and trying to do as many things as, by the book as possible and do the right thing by chef. Um, when you bring it back down to who you are and what you've done and what you've tasted as a child, everything starts to speak to you a little bit more. 
things start to become a little bit more clearly. So we ask ourselves, you know, the, the first thing I said this morning, you know, what you have to think of at this seminar is eat your veggies because one day you'll have to do a seminar about veggies. So if you guys don't do it, eat some veggies now. You might be talking on stage one day. Um, and then I started asking myself some questions. You know, how do, we, how do we raise the status, right, which is our title right now. How do we raise the status, of, uh, the status of something that we're fully aware of, but sometimes we don't always give in to doing. So we know that veggies are there. We know that uh, when we go to the store, we see things like this, and we see the carrots, and it's cool, and they're different colors, but it's like, no, let's just get the ribeye tonight. We'll get the ribeye, we'll just get some rice, and we'll cook some rice. It's just kind of like one of those natural things that you go through. But in, in La Condesa, and even what we do for the restaurant and for the culture, we try to impart as many vegetables as possible because the cuisine is founded on veggies, right? If you have a chicken or a piece of pork or a piece of beef, then you're almost rich at that point if you're in Mexico. And if you think of salsas and if you think of guacamole, you can get full off that, and that's just veggies alone. So we're going to do two dishes today. Uh, we're going to do some tacos, because why not? And, you know, we... When we were coming up with this dish too, the, the joke that was always running in my mind was that vegans like to have fun too. We read about it somewhere, there was an article, maybe it was on Facebook, maybe it came through us in another social media aspect, but we, we thought of something you know, that can be playful, but also give a familiarity. So tacos is one of those bases right there. There's plenty of veggie tacos for sure. Um, I, I think when I was thinking first of how to do a taco, I didn't realize that you can do so many flavors of pastor. So we're going to talk about a pastor style taco, which is using butternut squash. So in the restaurant right now, we use butternut squash. I use turnips. You can use things like zucchini, even radishes. But the main goal to creating flavor, the main goal to making it fun and familiar for people is to first give the vessel, which is a tortilla. And we love tacos in Texas and we do in California. I've seen plenty. And then also to have that cool like pastor feel because pastor is the cool fun uh, late night, early morning, midday dinner snack, which basically means you can have pasta anytime you like, but incorporating them into uh, the flavors and keeping it vegan, you wouldn't even really you know, have an idea that you're eating vegan food right there. And when we do vegan items for people, and when we do them at events, people eat it and it's, they think I'm lying. Well, I'm not, but we're doing lots of cool things to make it all feel really uh, cool. Is there some oil? So... Pastor is one of those things that goes back in history to um, shepherd style, and it was something that was created in central Mexico by Lebanese Christian immigrants. And this is the taco that you see on TV where it's got the trompo, and there's a bunch of meat, and people are cutting it off like shawarma style, right? I love it. Whenever we go to travel to Mexico City, we try to um, out-pastor the other guy. So if we can get five tacos, six tacos, someone else will get eight. Um, so immediately when it was like talking to my Sue, talking to the, to the team, what can we do? Well, we can do some veggies. We can stay with a base. And the base for us is, you know, always the chile, right? So we have things like guajillo for color. We have cascabel for sour, pasilla. And then we use grapefruit. We use some oranges, some oregano, fresh if you like. And that's the base right there. And building the flavor right here is getting the butternut into the pan. And this is the same way we do it in the restaurant, the same way we do it for ourselves also. Building that roasty flavor, so in Thanksgiving when you roast your butternut squash, either whole or you, or you cut it in half and you put it into your oven, or you cut them into little planks and you can sear them hard and get that caramelized brown thing going on, it's the same thing that we're going to do right here. So basically building flavor, and it goes back to what you learned in culinary school, right? Building that fond on the very bottom, getting all the sticky bits that are going to form right there from all the sugars in the butternut squash. The deglazing happens from this guy right here. And it's pretty fun because when you deglaze, it gets like really peppery, it gets a little aggressive, but then you know you're building tacos. Um, going back to when I was a younger cook and working in New York, you were taught on entremet, which is your vegetable station, to be the vegetable. And I thought I was just getting made fun of again. I was like, all right, I'm gonna be the vegetable. I don't know what chef is telling me, but at least he said it in English, right? So I was the vegetable in 2009. I cooked all the vegetables, I turned all the potatoes, I turned all the carrots. But what he was really saying is when you're trying to find your strategy and you're trying to develop your flavors, you really have to go back to paying respect to, I mean, how this butternut squash came to be. So there's farmers, right, and there's plenty of farmers in Texas and, and wherever we're coming from right now. For us at La Condesa, 
paying back to them is a big deal for us. So when we show them that we're cooking their food just like this, and to see them smile, it's almost just ridiculous. You almost just want to give them a big hug and ask for a discount on the next box of butternut squash that comes in right there. But it doesn't work like that, right? Uh, but yeah, paying respects to it, um, showing your, your teams or your, you know, the people that are crafting your menus that you know, it doesn't just come from a box and then you just throw it in the walk-in and then you like, deal with it later. It's really trying to like, take care, understand, break it down. It's the stuff that you don't have time for and when you make time for, it makes a difference in the end. It's all the little details that add up. So it's funny that I'm getting this deep about this for a taco, but when it, when it comes out and we start to look at it, do we have those boards? There we go. And it starts to come out really nice. It pays off. You know, it pays off really nicely. So we could see it there in the little camera right there. It's starting to build its little crust, starting to do its thing. We have some tortillas right here. So luckily in our little corner of the world in the kitchen over there, we have plenty of masa, plenty of tortillas. So it was good to just ask out loud and then tortillas appear in your hand. So that's fun. Um, when you're building this taco right here specifically and still trying to create your flavors, we've added our salt. We'll do our chili a little bit early so we can get through because uh, I really want to talk about carrots. I like carrots. You have this deglaze happening right here. So that's that chili right there. And it'll probably start to stink it up in a little bit. We'll all start sneezing here for the next conference, the last bits of the conference. Building, getting all that color, getting that sauciness going on right there, that's what we're looking for. It's the, uh, if you haven't had a pastor taco, I keep talking about it. It's just one of those things that we talk about in the restaurant. When you're eating it, it's not the prettiest thing. You eat it and everything's kind of running down and you wish you could eat your elbow at that moment in time. That's when you know you're doing it right and you're eating tacos. At this point right here, you can add a little bit of citrus. And those are some fun techniques right there when you're building proteins because we're treating, just, treating this just like a protein. Tortillas are getting hot. How many of us do we have today? Do we have enough tacos and tortillas to go around? So this is a fun, playful way to throw it down. We did uh, our tastings the past two days here. And even at the restaurant, we have these really nice little boards that we use. And it looks cool. and looks fun when it hits the table. This is just a little bit of crushed avocado. So keeping it simple at this point, throwing your garnish down. This is the fat. So when you're eating vegan food, your, your palate's still going to yearn for a little bit of fat. So we use things like tofu, we use things like this avocado because it's the good fat, right? And we throw it down and it's also just one of those glues that's going to hold the tortilla together. It smells kind of good over here. So we have everything here. That's going to sit down for us. And then we'll talk about our, um, our sauce. So the salpicón that we're going to do for this one, vegan, obviously, because we're doing a vegan dish right here. But we have things like, let me bring it to the light. We have things like pineapple, which is what a pastor usually gets. It's usually sitting at the top, and you cut it off, and it goes into the tortilla. We have things like uh, cilantro, serrano, onion, the cilantro stem. And we use a little bit of ginger, which is not traditionally in Mexican food. And then we also use yuzu. So yuzu is that really astringent, very strong acid that's going to bring everything together. So we've got our pastor. We'll mix everything together here. It's also just really pretty. And it helps cut through um, you know, the fear of, I don't want to eat vegetables. I don't want to do this vegan thing. Because sometimes vegan things aren't like super good. And it's hard to get down with them. And it's, really try it's, it's hard to understand them. Because I, just, uh, I think when people try to cook that way and try to be vegetable forward, there's just not a lot of thought into it. And I think when you cook vegetables, you really have to think about what you're doing because uh, for the meat in Texas, it's salt, pepper, piece of brisket, 15 hours, and then you have barbecue. And then you're famous. And then you don't have to do anything for the rest of the day. Well, when you're dealing with your vegetables, um, you plant them, you wait a few months, you pick them, hopefully you pick them, and then you want to treat them as proper as you can for your family, and then you want to have the chefs uh, reciprocate that and do the same thing 
and also try to make a living off of that. So we're, we're very conscious in the restaurant when we think about those things. So we got our little butternut squash here. And when you know, we're talking about tacos, we're not talking about the most beautiful things per se. Although Mexican food does have its place to have some really beautiful uh, plates and ingredients get shined every now and again. But for this one right here, primarily, we've, we've built a strategy and we made a taco, so that was easy, right? And then we've also done something too where we've created a flavor that you don't normally think of when you're throwing down on things like this. So you've got your fat, you got your butternut squash, you have this really pretty salpicon, which is like a, a relish per se. And it takes on really high acidic notes. And the pineapple is going to add sweetness, which is going to play really well with your butternut squash. And at the very end too, you know, when you travel to Mexico, you see radishes and nopales and lots of different like accoutrements or accents for your tacos. The radish to us in our restaurant means a lot. And, you know, I get made fun of a lot because we put radishes on everything. But to us, to me, it means a, a cleansing quality. So when you're eating sushi and you eat that pickled ginger to go on to the next course, it's going to wipe it out, right? When you eat radishes right here, it's going to add water to the dish. It's also going to add a little bit of a healthy crunch. And at the end of the day, it really does look pretty. And then you can add a little bit of cilantro, which is going to be our, our end all right there. So we've got a, a base of masa. We've got some fat. We have our protein, which in this sense is butternut squash, not pork. We've got our beautiful salpicon. And then when you look at that dish right there, you feel, you feel Mexican at that point. You're like, I'm going to speak Spanish as soon as I drink these two shots of tequila and share these tacos with everybody right there. So that's our uh, vegan al pastor taco. And now we're just kind of winging it because the the next part for me is the easiest. This is a, it's a carrot salad. And the basis for this one when we were dreaming this one up was how do you make that uh, coleslaw carrot salad that you ate in lunch with raisins and mayonnaise taste good? Or how do you play it uh, with a different tone and how do you play it louder and faster and try to get a reaction out of people? So this is, uh, it's basically carrots and, and cardamom yogurt. But when I break it down and you, and you hear all about it, it is carrots four ways. So we're treating the vegetable like a piece of meat, right? We've heard of nose to tail. We're thinking of leaves to root. You know, you treat the whole thing as if, it, as if it's a piece of pork, a heritage pork, or an animal that you've had and you're raising. We're going to use the whole thing. We're going to pay respect to it also. And then we're also going to do as many different techniques to, you know, one, keep us engaged. And then two, show that uh, when you get carrot tops in your, in your grocery bag, you can use them. You can use them all. You can roast your carrots like such. You can pickle them, shave them, ferment them. There's so many different things you can do with them. Char them, burn the heck out of them, whatever it is. Um, and they can all be used. And all the sugars in them too just makes sense. So this salad came to be about six years ago. Um, it actually became very famous. We were fortunate enough to work with... Uh, um, Honda for a commercial for our, our restaurant and the main theme was me and my silly carrots You know, they were just like chef if you if you had a power vegetable, what would it be? Well, it'd be a carrot because this commercial is about a carrot and you can look it up and it's real And there's there's a whole commercial about it and there's a Honda car and then there's this carrot salad Which people are just like oh my god here he goes again, but it's really cool to talk about it in this uh, in this format Because I can show you guys that you can meld a lot of different cuisines build your strategies the same way and then still build a lot of flavor and not just pertain it to Mexican cuisine, but you can go all the way around the globe because when we think of Mexican cuisine, uh, or at least what I do, you think of how many different cultures have uh, been into that country, how many have left and how many are still there now. You know, when we talk about this pastor, that's not really a Mexican thing, right? You know, and when we're talking about a carrot and cardamom salad, we're thinking like, oh my gosh, are we going to India? Or are we going to Guatemala? Guatemala, right behind India, is the second biggest producer of cardamom. So we have this cardamom yogurt, and we use a full fat yogurt in, inside the restaurant. Uh, locally, we try to stay as local as we can. We're still going with that same base of that little shredded whatever carrot salad you had on your lunch plate in high school and how we're trying to elevate it at that point. So that's the fun part of it right there. 
So we've pre-roasted some carrots, and this just has a little bit of garlic, a little bit of oil, um, some salt and pepper, and we've tried to keep them in their whole state. So then for the pickup is, you know, we want to add uh, some different temperatures. We want to add some different textures. We want to add stuff so it's just not one solid note. It's just like playing music or being a DJ. You don't want the same thing all the time. Um, to me, like a fish concert, and I'm sorry if anybody likes fish, but there's always the bass line where you just hear it and you're just like, is he ever going to go anywhere else on any octave at any time? I don't know. I haven't stayed long enough for a fish show, I'll tell you that. <laughs> So that's what we're doing here, you know, and I, I base a lot of it, my sous chef's over here glaring at me and saying weird things to me, but we play music in the kitchen because we're trying to push the boundaries and trying to have that equalizer within food and trying to have it all within the same realm of what we're doing for this food, but make people just be like, you know, shake your head in a weird kind of way, like, why did that, why did I taste that over there? Why did this crunch over here? What am I doing? Where am I? So we have some carrots. We're roasting them now. We're going to get them hot again. The base or the fat is our cardamom yogurt. So at this point, you know, we're going vegetarian, not vegan anymore. <clears throat> so we've got cardamom. We toasted it off. Michael helped us clean them right there. He was very nice all week long. We, we appreciate all the help we've gotten. <clears throat> and then we've got these carrots, right? So it's like, all right, we've gone to the grocery store. Kids are kind of like yelling and running all over the place. You know, I wish, um, when I look at these vegetables now, I wish I would have eaten more of them or explored a little bit more. But um, my mom says all the time when I was an infant and I had no say in anything that all I wanted was carrots as a kid. So that's all I ate and I started turning orange. And then mom freaked out and she's like, all right, okay, he's got to do something else. So it's kind of funny how you, you know, you go through so many years in life and so many decades and here you are, you're 30 something years old and you're like still doing carrots. I guess I would make mom proud at this point, you know, that I just stayed with it. So we have these carrots and they're beautiful. You know, you've got some different char. You've got some of that inside orange right there, some yellow ones. And to me, this is awesome. It builds uh, color and you, you, you see it first and you try to understand, okay, this is a lot going on. And that's the main goal of that one right there. Can you help me bring all this over right here? Thank you, sir. So we have, <coughs> sorry, carrots roasted, one. We have carrot chimichurri, two. We have some raw carrots that I feel everyone should just look at for at least a few hours. To me, that's mesmerizing. These are the carrots that we used in their raw form. And you slice them thin enough you treat them nice enough and you wash them, you know, two or three times and they just start to naturally do their own thing. And for us in the restaurant, you know, the less we do to it, the more we try to play, you know, nice with this ingredient and, and do the best we can for what it is, the better it is for me. And I feel really calm at that point. So we've got them in four different ways. And the last one right here is the carrot pickle. And those can be cut any way you like. We've also got an element of crispy um, and then using uh, orange and mint. So we've got this quinoa which is a, a member of the amaranth family, and we love amaranth because it's got a little bit of bitter. So you've got our carrots already. We're gonna do the raisin thing again. These are the currants, so we had to keep the raisins in the whole setup, right? Shredded carrots, mayonnaise, and raisins. Delicious lunch in high school. Okay, that's our base. And then we have these cool little pickles and the different shapes and different textures, still from the same animal, the same plant. This one right here. And then we're going to dress these carrots up in our carrot top chimichurri, which is going to have a little bit of spice in it. So it is the carrot tops. A few more herbs to your liking, arugula, cress, anything of that nature if you're feeling comfortable with it. And it dresses, and this is the acid right here for the entire dish. When it starts to come together, it looks like one of those things where it's like, okay, man, this is awesome came out of a magazine. But when you go to your grocery store, you knock your list out, you can buy the carrot, buy a couple things of yogurt, and you get something like this. We've got the carrot tops to incorporate again, which if you haven't tasted, I recommend you do because it holds, I feel like, some of the most intense flavor, just like cilantro stems hold some of those really intense flavors. And then we'll use a little bit of cilantro in this one too. 
building that salad so you've got a little bit of green on there, familiar, familiarity. And then we've got mint because the mint, which comes from like right outside the front door here, the mint is one of those things that's gonna draw it together because we also have it in our crispy quinoa. So it's another element of texture and it lends another uh, layer of the depth. And when you eat a carrot salad like this, we've done it before, we've kind of changed people's perception of what vegetables are, what they can be treated as. And for us, this is um, one of our shining moments in La Condesa. And that's it. Thank you very much. Chef, that is beautiful, stunning, and uh, certainly exemplary of using um, vegetables as the center of the plate. So fantastic job. Um, we are out of time, but if you want to come up and ask any questions of the chef or, or take a quick sample of his uh, dishes here, help yourself. Um, and then remain in this room for the, or you'll, you'll wrap that up. But thank you, thank you, Chef. Thank chef you. Rick, thank you very much. Cheers. Thank and you. thank you all for joining. I just wanted to add that a few years ago, um, Rick did a demo at our Latin f uh, Flavors Conference that we used to have at the San Antonio campus, and he roasted a whole cauliflower. And now it's a dish that you see absolutely everywhere, but at the time, it had never been seen anywhere. So we have a pioneer of plant-forward cooking right there. Thank so you. thank you, Rick. Awesome. Thank, you, <laughs> thank you, Todd. Thank you, BMW, for this wonderful session. Uh, grab some coffee, stretch your legs, and stay right here for our next and last general session of the day, which is also how I'll tell you how to win at the... Um, uh, contest tonight at the um, uh, at the party, so you don't want to miss that.